Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm here with a dear friend and colleague and change maker. Her name is Jessie Johnson. Welcome. Thank you so much, Elena. Gosh, it's nice to hear your voice. Yeah, you too. I wish we lived closer. Well, we, you know, um, we do now. <laughs> actually, we do now. That's truth. You're speaking. <laughs> Jessie, for my listener, Jessie's an activator. She's a success and mindset coach. She's more than that, though. She's like the most soulful. I don't want to say coach. I don't want to say coach. But you're one of the most soulful humans I know mm. who talks about money in exactly the way that I feel about it. Mm. Your gift lies in your ability to help others see their potential for profit, impact, and freedom in their lives. And it's a gift that has not only allowed you to build your own multi-million dollar company from scratch in two years, but also to support your clients as they do the same. I firmly believe as we open up this talk that growing wealth is a form of activism. I absolutely agree. I can't say it enough. I'm going to keep saying it until we're dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to talk to you about how you went from being a high school math teacher, which by the way, thank you for that. And thank you for so many <laughs> small understandings that you've offered to me in my interview with you from a high school math teacher to a seven figure entrepreneur. Please teach us how this happened. Yeah. A big change. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it's so beautiful that we're having this conversation now while race is such a mainstream topic and the conversation about activism is changing so quickly. It feels to me like there's space, like an invitation to go both in a new direction with you and deeper in that, in the whole conversation, because that's on the table in such a different way. That's right. I started teaching high school math after trying to make it as an artist in New York City, artist and activist. And it was just like, okay, I can't, like, I I'm sacrificing my purpose in order to make money. That's not what I came here for. What can I do that will give back? What can I do with my white privilege and education and passion and intelligence? What can I do that will make the world a better place? And the best idea that I came up with was teaching high school math. I live for that. I mean, that, that was the reason my contribution to dismantling systemic oppression manifested as becoming a high school math teacher in New York City public schools. And it was so hard. Lord, it was hard. It was hard on so many levels. I think teaching is very difficult. Public schools are difficult places to be, beautiful places to be, but challenging. Working with teenagers is hard. Being totally unskilled at that process was hard. And I grew up in North Carolina, so it's like I had no, like rural North Carolina. So New York City public school experience was pretty unfamiliar to me mm. until I stepped into the role of teacher. So there was just a huge learning curve for me. And right in the beginning, the emotional demand of what teaching required and, and I'll, I, we can go deeper with this, Teach, specifically teaching low-income students of color. The emotional demand of that work was bigger than anything I'd ever experienced before. It wasn't so much that my suffering was so great, although there was that. It was that I was literally holding a container for a bunch of humans, beautiful young humans, whose suffering was pretty great. And... I had been, in, you know, kind of my parents were hippies and I knew how to meditate, do yoga in various ways when I was growing up. But I like teaching is what brought me to my, my seat, 
teaching is what called me to actually deepen my meditation practice because that was the the best way I knew how to support myself. And so at the same time that I was becoming a pretty good math teacher, I was becoming a pretty good meditator. And they really developed in parallel. And 12 years later, I was coaching math teachers all over New York City. Wow. And teaching yoga. I'm sorry, not teaching mm-hmm. yoga. I was teaching meditation. I said yoga because I was thinking that during that time, I was teaching meditation sometimes at Vera Yoga. Right. So like my spiritual leadership and my professional leadership grew together. And this I can say also more articulately today than ever before. What happened was that I, I had worked on all the parts of myself that I could. I had done the work to actually figure out how, how to improve the things that I had control over. And after 12 years, of course, there was still room for improvement, but I knew enough to see that the thing that was not working didn't have to do with me. It had to do with the system. And that my role as a white educator in New York City public schools was not actually creating creating system change. So my kids had, and I had great relationships when I was coaching teachers, my teachers and I had great relationships. There were tremendous impact on that local personal level. I don't want to diminish that. That's true for anyone working in those schools. But the system that we were actively, daily, over time working to dismantle was just rebuilding itself over and over and over again. God. And I wanted to do something where I felt like my spiritual leadership and my professional leadership could be used at the same time. I wanted to also see the impact of my work. And I I didn't have language for it really until now, but I think I wanted to see system level change. I wanted to see system level impact. Yeah. And so long story short, I started a business and learned how to change my class, which is something that I, in retrospect, I was trying to teach all those kids how to do, how to change the class from low income to middle class or something like that. And now it's it's like well of course that didn't work (laughs) of course tell me more about what you saw systemically in the school Mm. that made you believe that there was nothing that one person could do i saw lots of things one of the things that i saw was the way that i think about it now is that there's a culture of scarcity in schools the, the value around there not being enough has become quite entrenched. There's not enough textbooks. There's not enough space. There's not enough time. There's not enough money. There's not enough love. There's not enough, not enough, not enough, not enough. And I mean, I think this is in many ways, this is a very, frankly, American or Western value scarcity. This is how we justify complaining about so much, you know, but in schools, there's so much reality of that scarcity that it's quite, it's really quite a spiritual practice to go into that environment day after day and not participate in it. To the extent that positive change, actual transformation is happening in schools, actual learning, actual healing, actual help, I believe it is because someone, whether it's a student, a teacher, a parent, an administrator, a social worker, someone is refusing to participate in the story of not enough. Right. And no matter how many people do that, the system is still reintroducing the not enoughness. And so it's it's like an kind of an insurmountable thing. That that's my theory on it now. The the system regenerates the story of scarcity so powerfully, so pervasively that while individuals can work the system and find some power in it, the system itself isn't changing. Guess what? Until now. <laughs> I, think, I, th- I think until now. I think just in seeing the discussion and also movement toward the reallocation of funds not just from the police, but definitely from there, but also from from all the other places that have been sucking public funding for way too long. The reallocation of funds toward the schools, 
That is what will change this. I agree. It's one of the strange powers of the quarantine that it, it really kind of broke the system, which is a helpful thing when we're trying to make it in a very new way. Agreed. So after that, you started your own business. You, what was the first, I, I'm asking you this sort of granular question because I want my listener to hear, what was the first thing you did? Like, what do you remember? The, before I started my business, I hired a coach. And I, I like to tell that story because I don't think that everybody realizes it can go in that order, but I can't imagine it going in any other order. I wouldn't have seen the option of starting my own business had I not hired my coach first. She helped me realize that the thing I was wanting was a level of autonomy that, that aligned with owning my own business and was able to help me kind of connect the dots so that I could move through the mindset material to actually take that identification on. Because I, I was a leader, I was a teacher, I was a spiritual teacher, I was all kinds of things, but I wasn't, I did not have that identification. So there was a, a little blip for me around that blind spot. And she helped me in a very short period of time. Like we worked together that first program was eight weeks. And by the end of the eight weeks, I had a program that I wanted to sell. I knew who I wanted to sell it to. I had learned some, just some basic things about sales and was starting to tell people what I was up to. And, and in those two months was ready to quit my day job. You know, I I didn't actually, I wanted to finish the school year, but I was, I knew that the business itself mm, had legs you know, and that if I, if I was able to put my full time into it, it would, it would run. Right. Stunning. And then when you started to do that, you left your job. What was the period of time between leaving your job, cutting off your income and then beginning to earn in your entrepreneurship? How long did that take? So I hired my first coach in October, 2015 I wanted to quit and was like kind of ready to quit in that like December New Year period, but I chose not to. But I did, I signed my first client in January of 2016. And I did a kind of crossfade. So I was, I was working two jobs, basically working in my own business, having sales conversations, getting to know people, telling people what I was doing, putting myself out there, doing little mini workshops, playing, you know, designing a website, getting on social media, all those things at the same time as I was closing out my final school year. And then, so like, I don't remember how much money I made, but I was, I was working, I I was coaching and I was building the business throughout those six months of transition. The summer of 2016 is when I left and it was very inconsistent for me. You know, there were months when I didn't make anything and there were months when I made 20,000 bucks. It was like very, as, as new entrepreneurs should experience, really, you know, I think that was an important thing for me to feel, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to this new business. And now I have steady income that I can just chill and expect the paycheck to come in. There was something I needed to learn about cause and effect and how Mm. my, this new role, this new career path demanded a different level of personal responsibility. Yeah. It's funny. I can feel that. I I remember who you were back then before all Mm -hmm. this. It's almost like it was bubbling under the surface, what you were ultimately going to do. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing to hear the story from your perspective now, this many years later, six years later. So when you are working with your clients, you, you have an incredible impact on people. It's not just some bunch of words. You change people's lives. I've seen it. I would love to hear what your finest work has been. You don't have to name names or anything, but what's your finest work to date? Like if you could say to your grandmother or somebody, I'm most proud of this that I did. What is that? It's it's like uh, tearing up the way that you're framing that question. So generous. You're so generous, Elena. I love you. I love the way that you approach life. I'm so grateful to know you and be with you in this lifetime. Gosh, thank you. So three things came up as you said that. One is 
just for fun, like a, a money win. One of my clients hired me. She didn't have a business. She was superstar, like really high powered. She'd written a book. She'd been working some six figure corporate job. She, you know, she like knew what it was to be out there in the world doing something. She hired me. She wanted to start a business. She had no idea what it was. And really the thing that I did with her was help her choose, help her put her stake in the ground next to one of the 17 big visions that she had. And six weeks later, she made $160,000, which is more money than she'd ever made in a year before. Wow. <laughs> and that was really fun to watch her yeah. just move so fast from dream from vision from possibility into creation yeah and her vision in the next year or or three or five everyone will know her name <laughs> absolutely clear she's she's on an exponential trajectory so she's doing amazing work and for my listener for my listener what how did she make that money was it a course a, a product tell us she is consulting in the natural foods industry. Her vision is that grocery stores will not have natural food aisles because everything will be natural foods. Oh, wow. And so cool. she has a beautiful story. Her name is Kate Labras. She has okay. a beautiful story of really using natural foods to heal bipolar disorder that was almost crippling for her about a decade ago. That's what her book is about, her first book. Wow. And so she just believes in this fully. She knows the space. She's got a tremendous network, and it's really inspiring to watch her turn it up. Yeah, yeah. It's gorgeous. And then you were about to say something else when I rudely interrupted you. <laughs> Sorry about that. So the second story is about a new client. She is a woman of color. And she teaches money mindset. Our work is actually really similar. And it's been so, like, I feel like my, I actually have had the experience that my whole life has been so that I can be in this relationship with her. And not to put extra pressure on her or anything like that, but there is something about my 20 years of work in activist system level change, really trying to move the needle there that has prepared me to position her to be this powerful woman of color, empowering other women of color in finding liberation, claiming their own liberation through wealth, through financial freedom, through understanding money. Can I want to help. I need to help. <laughs> what, what can I do? I want to share her work. Please help me. Her name is Erica Matos. I'm going to interview M-A-T-O-S. Oh, and Erica's Erica is with, with a K. A C? Okay. Erica Good. with a K. Yes. Erica Matos. Listen and she, to this oh, she, name. Is, she is the one for this work. It's so, mm. so, I mean, there's many of us, but, you know, back to back we stand. But she yeah. is so inspiring. I'm so grateful and honored to be able to be in her life at this time. You know, her, one of her moments in the last week, two weeks, I guess, as the race conversation has escalated was really about like, who am I to shine during this time? Who am I to be making money during this time? And coaching her through that and helping her claim her own understanding that actually this is, this is her time. This is the most important time for her to be serving, shining, thriving. So I'm super inspired by her. Growth of wealth is activism. That's right. That's right. And if those are the two that you're most proud of in your sort of putting your hand under somebody's sole of their shoe and lifting them up what changes in you when you do that when you see somebody rising the way that kate will or erica will when you see that happening what changes in you beautiful question what's interesting is that a huge part of my work to get here to get to that seven figure mark to actually get really like squeaky clean about my own 
transmission as a healer, spiritual teacher, coach, is that I, I kind of have to not get anything out of it in a, in a way. There has to be an untethering of that old codependency that I, I think I probably cultivated early on, but I definitely cultivated as a teacher where it was like their, their success, their grades literally determined my success. It, they showed me if they got A's, that meant I was a good teacher. If they failed the regents, it meant that I was a bad teacher. Like it was very black and white. Hmm. And it made it pretty messy because I was wanting their success for them, but I was also wanting it for me. And right. so that's not the only thing, but that's the, the foundation on which I want to share everything else is that actually I make it a practice to, to not get anything out of it, to not, to not let it do anything on the inside of me because it's not about me. It's not for me. It's for them. Beautiful. And then on top of that, it's like, yeah, this is what we're all here for. We are here to contribute. We are here to help each other. We are here to lift each other up. And so when the lifting happens, when I get to participate in that, I do feel a sense of alignment and resonance and like, yeah, this is what it, this is what we came here for. This is it. This is it. Yeah. It's funny, that sense of alignment and resonance, that's what I think the listener came to this episode to hear. Mm. Like, how can you create in your own work a circumstance where someone else is lifted up, someone else gets to shine, particularly in this moment, if you're a white person or white passing and you could do this for someone of color mm. and feel that resonance, feel that in your body. That is a healing. You're healing cellularly when you feel that. What in your life needs some sort of healing right now in your personal life. Mm. I ask that of every, almost every guest, just so you know. There are these pockets of unintegrated or unconscious material that I am looking at right now. One of them is in my throat, in my, like, in my expression, in particular in my creative expression, my musical expression. I've been working with two beautiful songwriting coaches and that is going straight into that, that I, looking at like, this is a funny example, but looking at like all the freaking boyfriends that I've had who didn't want me to sing all of the, all the relationships I've had with freaking musicians who didn't see me as, as an, uh, valuable in my own musicianship until now. Well, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> Cause who cares? I yeah. love that. Perfect. <laughs> um, but I know, I know that that is, that's not a concluded healing. There's more to do there. And the other is interesting to share with you, but the other one is like, there's an, a relationship between my belly and my sacrum that's, that's physical, emotional, spiritual, energetic. There's like lots of stuff going up on there, but it's like, there has been a, almost like a unconsciousness in my belly. And I, I'm type one diabetic just in the last five years. And so I, I wonder about that connection. That the first that was the first thing that came up when you asked. I was just like, yeah, physical healing. Mm, got it. And if you could name one, what is your favorite view? And that could be a <laughs> view from inside, outside, you know, go go crazy. There is a really fancy very very expensive like hotel kind of it's not a hotel it's like a what do you call that like little 10 times higher class than any retreat center i've ever been to called post ranch in big sur i've been there and they have this restaurant mm -hmm. that looks <laughs> out over the ocean that's right and i had the pleasure of being on retreat with my coach this is a couple years ago in big sur and I was, and I, it was a dark retreat. I was blindfolded the whole time mm. to be in Big Sur and be blindfolded the whole time. I mean, it was like, what? Big Sur is like one of the natural wonders of the world. And they took my blindfold off on the edge of that cliff view. No. So I, I, after not seeing anything for like two days, my first view was just this enormous, glorious expanse of the Pacific 
off that little deck or balcony at Post Ranch. Which is uh, several hundred feet high. Yeah. And when you're standing there, it doesn't matter what time of the day it is, there's like this glimmering, shimmering garland of light that crosses the ocean in some mm -hmm. form that you've never seen before and you'll never see again because it just doesn't happen the same way anywhere else. Anywhere else. It, it, that is why I live. There's a funny story about that, actually, because right when that happened, I had just signed a lease on a new house in Venice put down an exorbitant amount of money to cover the first, like first, last security, whatever. And like maybe a day before the retreat started. And then I saw that and I just wept and it was like, I just got to see the ocean. I've, I've chosen the wrong house. We have to keep looking. And I, I ended up having to give up all that. It was like $30,000. I just gave up so that I could break the lease and move to where we now live, which is right on the Pacific. Not quite as not quite as spectacular as Big Sur, but it's pretty good. No, you're at sea level now, but it, you're staring at the ocean all the time. It's Marina del Rey. All the so time. So beautiful. Yeah. Yep. And my last question would be, what does prayer mean to you mm. at this time? You know, as when you ask me about my I the beautiful question about how my favorite impact or my favorite gift or something. Yeah. There was a third story which connects to this as a nice mm, little tie-in. Nice. That I, I took, Shri and I together, my husband Shri Kala, took uh, eight entrepreneurs, visionaries to India in January. And the intention was to connect them to this bigger than our human body experience. And the truth is, I think that the, the, the intention, I didn't have language for it then, but was to stop the world. Like you can't, as a Westerner, you can't go to India and not have all your patterns disrupted. <laughs> it's just like, it, it, nothing works, nothing makes sense. Nothing is, is so, so different. Mm. And so that was the original intention. But what happened when we got there is that I broke open in my prayer weeping on the floor in these temples and it, mm -hmm. it was like it opened a portal for them to walk through and meet god and i i left feeling like yeah i'm like matchmaking these beautiful people that i meet and their own version of god yeah um so that's wow. that's that that's like a story but it's also the heart of my prayer that everything i'm doing is with that backdrop for my own life that I want all of my actions, all of my thoughts, all of my movements to be prayerful. They're not, <laughs> but, I, but that's my practice. And you're, and you're matching people. You're, that, that's something really profound. Think about it for a second. Everything that you do, money, no money. You're matching people with their understanding of what spirituality, divinity really is yes. in the context of creating abundance like we're yes. for real not just abundance the way that stupid word is bandied about but abundance in all forms it's so cool i think it's i really believe that that's also there's an there's an activism for people of color mm. disenfranchised populations in doing mm. the work around money mm -hmm. and there's a there's a complementary like almost sibling work that spiritual teachers are doing spiritual people are doing around money it's just the next edge it's like the next chapter in the curriculum we cannot truly if we think that money is bad we don't understand god if we think that we're not supposed to have money we don't understand god we don't understand spirituality if we think that money is somehow not spiritual we don't understand spirituality there's it's very very important teaching money only carries the energy that we give it mm -hmm. is what i've been taught when you Absolutely. think about money, what kind of energy does it carry for you and for your clients? Freedom, beauty, impact, devotion. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm capable of doing so much more. <laughs> yes, yes. That's the thing. Yeah, it, and it goes both ways. You know, the, the work that I've had to do on the inside in order to receive money 
is in many ways more important than the money itself. And then what I do with the money that I earn also, they're, they both feel like massive, two sides of the same coin of liberation. Yeah. Your, your partner, are you guys married? Hmm? You are. Your husband. Yeah. <laughs> I love that man. Sri Kala is a black man. Yes. One of the most beautiful black men, actually. Yes. And <laughs> I love him very much. We used to have so much fun together. Yeah. Um, talk to us about, f- for my predominantly white audience, I'm really mm. trying to put myself in the position of, I want to educate my audience and my listener on what it means to be a white person from all different facets and sides of experience because we we can't you know it's like telling a fish about water Mm, yes so tell us what it what it's been like in the moments when it's been difficult for you guys to be present together in community tell us what it's been like when it's been wonderful and supportive give us both Mm. sides of the coin Mm. you know Sri is a very unique black man he's I think his he's it's actually this last couple of weeks has really called him more into his identity as a black man. I think in part because he did such deep spiritual work very early on. He I think he moved into the ashram when he was 17. So he became a monk and started doing this deep spiritual work. Whoa. At that like before he was really even an adult. And so he's distinctly not identified with his body in general. That fundamental principle, I am, we are the soul, we are not this body, is so deeply rooted in him. That and, is a deep, wait, hold on, just let me hold okay. on for a second. Because <laughs> anyone listening to this who's even rem- remotely connected to a spiritual quest, in the end, that is what we're after. Like, oh, this body means nothing to me, I'm really after what the soul realizes in in the end, you know, when you leave your body, how, how, how elegant can your death be? Mm. I talk about that Mm. a lot, but that's spiritual bypassing right now. (laughs) That's like the ultimate. Mm -hmm. And what I love that you've just pointed us to is that that's kind of where it began for him. It's almost like going backwards in time. And now he gets to reclaim his blackness. Yes. Which is a very beautiful thing. Okay, go on. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I love it when you interrupt me. It's, it's, you're absolutely right. He, his work really, since we met, we've been in partnership for about 10 years now. And throughout that time, he has been integrating his I would say almost kind of enlightened understanding of who he really is into his body. Hmm. And there is, there's a different, right. This is, this is true for all of us. I think as spiritual seekers really in 2020, like anyone who's doing this work in 2020 has got to be doing both the work of who are we really? And also, how do we bring it into the world? We're not meant to live in caves and meditate for the rest of our lives. Most of us, some of us, but most of us are here to bring the spiritual teaching into our lives. And so it's been fascinating. I, like I'm honoring that Sri's been doing that the whole time I've known him, but this last couple of weeks has been exponentially faster. He's like feeling the pain and the suffering and the the like urgency for change on a cultural level relating to the identifications of oppressor and oppressed not 100% in fact maybe not even 2% but but relating to them instead of just kind of moving beyond them right and as a result he is speaking to more people than ever before wow his his words are landing with people in new ways because he's integrating his physical identity with his spiritual truth, his spiritual soul. So, Hmm. and, and it's interesting, you know, we, we've spent a tremendous amount of time in spiritual community where most of the people are white and he is often the only black body or one of just a couple black bodies in a, in a huge transformational festival with thousands of people. Um, Yeah. I've been at 
I've seen it. Yeah, <laughs> I've yeah, been yeah. there when he is the yeah. one. He and Justin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so we've talked about that throughout the time, but this is the first time that I'm seeing him really catalyzed and, and both of us together to, yeah. to do, not just talk about it, not just kind of poke around at people, but to really raise the standard around what we're going to participate in. Yeah. And one of the most painful things, and I'll, I'll, I think this is useful also for the, the white audience. Like Definitely. I, I'm used to being able to go to Shree for anything. He's he's so good at loving. And everyone knows everyone that knows him knows this. Like he he is a lover. He is his love is strong and pretty unconditional. And so I'm used to going to him when I'm struggling with things as my husband, as my partner, as this as this beacon of love. Right. And as we've been unpacking our own responses to the escalating conversation about race. I have learned that there are things that he is not the one to support me with. My experience, the struggles that I have as a white woman dealing with, for example, like just feeling like, oh my gosh, how do I sit? How, I want to invite all these black women to speak on my, on my podcast, on my platform. Do I invite them because they're black women? Do I not talk about that? Like whatever the conundrums that I go through as a white person navigating this chargy landscape. He's call me not for the that. one to support no, exactly. He's not the exactly. one. You call me you call my ass. Yep. Yeah. And I, I you know I'm more upset than he is most of the time. Anytime that, I get that somebody's too. upset, I'm probably the one that's more upset. So it's like right, right. letting letting myself find that support ironically in white communities is mm. is more productive and yeah. then showing up for him curious and ready to move in whatever direction he wants to it's a very devotional space yeah that is I, that does come off of you too when i see you together the devotion the energy of devotion is emanating from the two of you mm. as a unit Thank that's you. something very special well I think this one is also going to be a to be continued moment because I don't <laughs> feel like I'm done with you yet. I want to respect your time and mine. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say how much respect I have for you, the importance of your work. And I would say, especially since my, again, predominantly white audience is listening, um, call every single person of color that you love, that you respect, and invite them on your podcast and on your broadcast. Why? Mm -hmm. Because it's time to center and feature their voices and let them shine. I have been completely negligent in this region, even though there are so many women of color that I love and men. And I just, it just wasn't even a thought. And now it's every thought. And now mm. I'm thrilled. I'm learning leaps and bounds every single day. I'm being fed. They're being fed. My audience is certainly being fed. And as things change, my intent is to continue evening out this playing field until there is no different playing field and there's no bumps and there's no, there's no hills. It's just one. Mm, amen yeah <laughs> I love you very much I look forward to our next chat I love you too Elena thanks so much thank you <laughs>